Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I want to talk about the Schrödinger equation in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The Schrödinger equation is one of the key equations in quantum mechanics. It tells us about the time evolution of quantum states. In this sense, it plays an equivalent role to that of Newton's second law in classical mechanics, which tells us about the time evolution of a classical system. So without further ado, let's get started with the Schrödinger equation. Let's go! Postulate 6 of quantum mechanics tells us what happens to a quantum state as a function of time. We describe quantum states with kets, and now we introduce their time dependence with this time variable t. The time evolution of such a ket is then governed by the Schrödinger equation written here. This equation is a postulate. This means that it is not something that we can derive. Instead, what we find is that all the predictions coming out of this equation are confirmed by experiment. So what does the Schrödinger equation tell us? On the left-hand side, we have the derivative of the state psi with respect to time, and this captures the time evolution of the ket. It is also multiplied by the imaginary unit i and the constant h-bar. This constant h-bar is equal to Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi, and is called the reduced Planck constant. This time derivative is then equal to the right-hand side, which is an operator h acting on the state psi. This operator plays a key role in quantum mechanics and is called the Hamiltonian. We know that operators in quantum mechanics are used to describe physical properties, so the central question to ask is what physical property does the Hamiltonian represent? The answer is that the Hamiltonian represents the total energy of the system. So if we look back at the Schrodinger equation, it tells us that the time evolution of the system is governed by the total energy of the system. So. What can we deduce about the time evolution of a quantum system from the Schrödinger equation? The key is that the equation is a first-order differential equation in time. This is key because all first-order differential equations can be solved unambiguously by finding first the general solution and then providing a boundary or initial condition. Once we have this, psi of t will tell us exactly what the state of the system is at any time t. It is critical that we understand what this means. The time evolution from the Schrödinger equation is completely deterministic. There is no ambiguity or probability involved. Once we know the state of the system at any point in time, say t0, then the Schrödinger equation tells us exactly what the state of the system will be at a later time, t. So a question you may have now is, given that the Schrödinger equation is deterministic, where does the famous probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics come from? As we discuss in the videos on measurements, it is postulate 4 of quantum mechanics that introduces a probabilistic dimension, but that is only relevant when we perform a measurement of some physical quantity. As a refresher, you'll remember that when we measure a general property A of the system, then we need to consider the associated operator A and its eigenvalue equation. Once we have this, the outcome of the measurement can only be one of the eigenvalues lambda n of the operator A associated with the property we're measuring, and we cannot say in a deterministic manner which eigenvalue we'll get. All we can say is that if our system is in a state psi, then the probability of getting an eigenvalue lambda n is given by this expression. There is a second important point about measurements, which is that if we start with a system in a state psi, and we do perform the measurement of quantity A, we will get some eigenvalue, say lambda n, as the outcome of the measurement. At this point, postulate 5 of quantum mechanics tells us that after the measurement, the state of the system changes dramatically and becomes Vn, the eigenstate associated with the eigenvalue lambda n that we got as the outcome of the measurement. So what we have to do now to properly understand time evolution in quantum mechanics is to combine the Schrodinger equation with measurements. Imagine that we start with a state psi at time t0. Then for as long as we don't perform any measurements, the Schrodinger equation, which I abbreviate by SE here, tells us what the system will be at a later time t1. This time evolution is deterministic. Now let's say that at time t1 we perform a measurement of property A. Then as a result of this measurement we can obtain any of the eigenvalues of the operator A up here, and before we do the measurement, all we can say is the probability of getting any of these eigenvalues. However, 
Once we have performed the measurement, we do get a specific eigenvalue, say lambda m. If we then follow postulate 5, the state of the system changes from psi to um. And this is the probabilistic step. And another important point to note is that the times here and here are the same, and that's because the state changes instantaneously with the measurement. So, right after the measurement, the state of our system is um. The subsequent time evolution is again governed by the Schrodinger equation, and we can determine the state of the system at a later time in a completely deterministic manner until we perform another measurement. From this discussion, we see that time evolution in quantum mechanics is quite different to that in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, the equivalent to the Schrodinger equation is Newton's second law of motion. Given a starting state for a classical system, we can calculate the state at a later time in a deterministic manner by solving Newton's second law. Additionally, we can measure a property of the system at any time t without affecting the system. So we only have to solve the time evolution once, and we know what will happen to the system at any later time. In quantum mechanics, we also have a deterministic time evolution of the state of the system psi, but it is only true as long as we don't perform any measurements on the system. The moment we perform a measurement, we introduce a probabilistic element by radically changing the state of the system to the eigenstate associated with the measurement outcome that we get. We then have to solve the Schrodinger equation again, starting with this new state to see how it will continue evolving in time. To learn more about the Schrodinger equation, in the rest of the video we're going to assume that we're not making any more measurements, so we're going to have only the deterministic time evolution given by the Schrodinger equation. Now that we know that the Schrodinger equation tells us about the time evolution of our system, it is obvious that we will spend a lot of time with this equation when we do quantum mechanics. Whenever we do that, we have to consider two questions. The first concerns the Schrodinger equation directly. Although the equation is universal, every system has a different energy, so the Hamiltonian h, which is the operator representing the energy of the system, will be different for every system. So the first question is, what is the Hamiltonian of the system under study? Writing down Hamiltonians is actually relatively straightforward. On the one hand, we have the kinetic energy of each particle in our system, and in a non-relativistic setting, the kinetic energy of each particle is given by the momentum squared divided by 2 times the mass of the particle. The second contribution to the total energy is the potential energy, and this term takes a different form for every system. For example, if we have two electrons, each of charge E, then the potential energy is given by the Coulomb interaction. This is just an example, but you can find many more in our other videos where we build the Hamiltonians for systems ranging from atoms all the way to materials. Ok, so once we have specified our system through the Hamiltonian, we get to the second question. How do we solve the Schrodinger equation? At this stage we can distinguish two situations. The first corresponds to what we call conservative systems, and these are systems in which the Hamiltonian itself is time independent. As we'll see in a moment, we can actually solve the Schrodinger equation for a conservative system once and for all, so this turns out to be an easy case. The second case corresponds to systems with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. The solution for time-dependent Hamiltonians is much more complicated, so we're going to leave the solution for later videos. As we just discussed, when we have a conservative system in which the Hamiltonian is time-independent, then the solution of the Schrodinger equation is in fact very simple. As always, when we solve a problem in quantum mechanics, the very first thing we have to do is to decide in which basis of representation we're going to solve the problem. We know that in principle all representations are physically equivalent, but from a mathematical point of view, choosing a good representation can make life much easier. So what is a good representation in which to solve the Schrodinger equation? As you may suspect, given that the operator that features in the Schrodinger equation is the Hamiltonian, describing the energy of the system, then we'll want to work in the energy representation. So how do we define the energy representation? We need to consider the eigenvalue equation of the Hamiltonian, h acting on un equal to en un. The un are the energy eigenstates, and the en are the energy eigenvalues, both of which are time independent if the Hamiltonian is time independent. The key is that the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator because it's an observable, so its eigenstates form a basis of state space, and this basis provides the energy representation that we're looking for. 
So now that we have the energy basis U, we can expand any arbitrary state psi of t in this basis. And as usual, the expansion coefficients Cn are given by the bracket between Un and the state. The eigenstates are time independent, so all the time dependent in this expansion is captured by the expansion coefficient c. The next thing we can do is write the full Schrodinger equation in the energy basis given by the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. We do this in the usual manner by acting with the bra un from the left on both sides of the equation. As un is time independent, we can move it inside the derivative here. For the right hand side, this here gives en times the bra un because the Hamiltonian age is Hermitian, so we can act on the bra with it. Putting this together, we get ih bar d dt of un psi of t equals en un psi of t. These are just the cn expansion coefficients, which provide the representation of the state in the energy basis. So we end up with the first order differential equation for the cn coefficients. We can now rearrange the equation like this. We can integrate both sides from t0 to t1. The integral on the left hand side is the logarithm of c and t, and the integral on the right hand side is trivial. Putting in the integration limits, we get this. And exponentiating, we get c n t1 equal to c n t0 e to the minus i e n t1 minus t0 over h bar. Let's make some room and copy the final expression we got for the time dependent c n. With this result, the time dependence of the Schrodinger equation for conservative systems is always the same, and we only need to follow this recipe. First, we find the energy basis in which we want to solve the problem. To do that, we have to solve the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian to find the energy eigenvalues and eigenstates. These eigenstates provide the energy basis. Second, we have to impose an initial condition, which is the state of our system at some initial time t0. We're working in the energy basis, so we expanded the state in this basis in terms of the c coefficients, where the c coefficients are given by the usual expression and provide the energy representation of the state. And third, at a later time t, the state of the system is obtained by simply adding the time dependence of each c coefficient, which is found up here, and we end up with this expression. We can now see the power of solving the problem in the energy basis. The time dependent is trivial because each cn coefficient evolves independently in time, and the time evolution is governed by the corresponding energy eigenvalue en. So once we have defined the energy basis by determining the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in step 1, steps 2 and 3 follow immediately. This means that for conservative systems, the difficult step is step 1. So most of our time doing quantum mechanics is actually dedicated to solving this eigenvalue equation for different Hamiltonians depending on the system we have. From a practical point of view, I provide a detailed demonstration of how we can apply this procedure to calculate the time dependence of a conservative system in the video called What Happens After a Quantum Measurement, which you can find linked in the description. Before we move on, a word about the nomenclature. Many people call this equation here the time-independent Schrodinger equation. I personally don't like this nomenclature very much, and I prefer to use the term eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian, which I think is clearer. However, I'm pointing this out because you will encounter this other name very often. The next idea I want to explore is a particularly interesting one. What happens when the initial state of our system is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian? This case is so interesting that it has its own name stationary states. We still consider a conservative system with this eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian. Now imagine that the initial state of our system is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, say um. Then following the procedure we just outlined, the state of the system at a later time t is simply given by this exponential, multiplying um. We can see that psi of t0 and psi of t only differ by this term, which is simply a global phase factor. So we know that the two states represent the same physical situation because global phase factors don't matter. This means that a system that is in an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian does not change with time, and this is why we call such states stationary states. The next idea I want to discuss concerns the conservation of the norm, 
which means that if the state of the system is normalized at some time t0, then the time evolution given by the Schrodinger equation does not change the normalization. To see this, consider the norm psi of t psi of t at some time t. We calculate the time derivative of this bracket. Using the chain rule, we get the derivative of the first term times the second, plus the first term times the derivative of the second. This bracket here is just the time evolution of the ket, so we can use the Schrodinger equation to rewrite it like this. This other bracket is the time derivative of the bra, so we can convert this expression to the dual space, and we get this. Remember that in going to the dual space we get the complex conjugate of all scalars, so we get the minus sign here, and in principle we should also get the adjoint of all operators, but the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, so we can directly write it out without the dagger. Going back to the derivative of the norm, we can now insert the derivative of the bra into this term to get this, and then the derivative of the ket into this term to get this. And now the result is zero. This confirms that the time derivative of the norm is zero, so indeed the normalization does not change with time. This makes our life easier because we only have to normalize the state once, and then if we evolve it in time using the Schrodinger equation, we don't need to worry about normalization again. This video has a few important take-home messages, so let's finish with a quick recap. Postulate 6 of quantum mechanics tells us how the state of a system evolves in time, and it does so in a deterministic manner between measurements. This time evolution is governed by this differential equation, called the Schrodinger equation. In this equation, the operator h here is called the Hamiltonian, and is the operator associated with the total energy of the system. Therefore, the first step in any quantum mechanical problem is to figure out what the Hamiltonian of our system is. Once we have done that, we can then move on to solve the Schrodinger equation. Solving it in general is a difficult problem, but when we have a conservative system in which the Hamiltonian is time independent, then the solution is very simple, and it involves three steps. The first is to solve the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian to determine the energy eigenvalues and eigenstates, because these provide the energy basis in which we solve the problem. The second step is to write down the initial state of the system in the basis of the energy eigenstates. And the third is that the state of the system at a later time t is given by this, where the time evolution is entirely captured by these exponentials. The Schrodinger equation is so important because it tells us about the time evolution of quantum states. You can find a simple example of this in our video What happens after a quantum measurement. Crucially, the Schrodinger equation features a very particular operator, the Hamiltonian, which is the operator associated with the total energy of the system. So far, in our discussion of the postulate of quantum mechanics, we've been treating all operators as equally important. We now see that the Hamiltonian has a special place, because it is the operator that governs the time evolution of the system. So if you've been studying quantum mechanics for a while, and you've been finding yourself mostly solving the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian, this is the reason why. For our own examples on how to solve the eigenvalue equation for a Hamiltonian, you can check out our videos on the quantum harmonic oscillator or the hydrogen atom. And as always, if you like the video, please subscribe.